All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Concrete Sustainability Hub's next installment of our public webinar series. Uh, our topic today is pavement life cycle assessment and more specifically uh, quantifying pavement environmental impacts using life cycle assessment. Uh, our panelist today is uh, Dr. Randy Kershane, who is co-director of the MIT Concrete Sustainability Hub. Just a couple of reminders, we are recording today's presentation. It will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, usually within a couple of days. Also, if you have a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A function at the top of your screen. Uh, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but feel free to ask them at any point. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Randy. Thank you, Anne. Um, I also just wanted to let everyone know that I'm also joined by Jin Zhu, who's one of the um, graduate students working uh, on this topic and sort of uh, uh, one of the person that's been responsible for uh, a lot of the results that you'll see uh, a little bit later in the presentation. As Anne just mentioned, uh, um, what we wanted to do today was to give you a little bit of a sense of um, what life cycle assessment is and what, what its role is for pavements and pavement decision making in particular. Um, give you a, a sense of uh, how we've been looking at life cycle assessment within the hub, some of the research directions we've been taking and then share with you a handful of lessons that we've learned from applying that research to a number of case studies across uh, for, for different pavement contexts across the U.S. Um, so to get started with that first question that I posed, you know, what is life cycle assessment? Well, we kind of have to step a bit back and um, understand that the motivation for what we're doing in, in life cycle assessment is to answer a question which you, we increasingly hear, which is, what is a green pavement? And um, I just sort of reconfirmed this right right before the webinar, but if you go out and Google uh, green pavement, you'll find that there are lots of different claims out um, um, on the internet and in, in the real world of um, that a green pavement involves things like making use of recycled materials, um, it might, um, uh, there's a lot that focuses on the pervious um, attributes of, of some pavement technologies as being what makes a pavement green. There are even things that um, are saving pavement, selling pavement solutions that actually incorporate um, uh, grass or other kinds of plants, and then that is a, a green pavement. So there are lots of um, claims and lots of different approaches to defining this, this question of what a green pavement is. And what the hub has been trying to promote in throughout its research portfolio is answering these kinds of questions about a green anything is best done through a holistic perspective that's not just looking at an individual attribute about what's in a pavement or an individual attribute of a particular performance characteristic of that pavement like its pervious nature, but trying to um, create a framework that allows us to fold many different aspects of, of performance, many different aspects of uh, uh, many different attributes into answering that question. And generally, we refer to that as a life cycle, that holistic perspective we kind of refer to as a, a life cycle perspective. And, and this, this is not just true for evaluating environmental performance, but economic performance as well. So when, you, when we talk about um, a life cycle perspective, what, what we want to understand is what are the impacts of a particular choice, in this case a, a pavement choice, on all the activities that are associated with realizing, that's making that pavement possible, with using that pavement, and event, eventually with its disposition. And so for pavements, of course, that includes the um, understanding the impacts associated with the materials that go into that pavement the uh, construction activities that turn those materials into the design that, um, that we intend, um, the activities that occur on that pavement or as a result of that pavement um, during its lifetime uh, of use, and then finally, any sets of activities that are associated with, say, maintaining or um, removing and disposing of that pavement, so-called the end of life. So that's the set of activities that we refer to um, in, in considering the life cycle perspective of pavements. Um, just to get a little bit of specifics of um, how we go from life cycle perspective to what we refer to as life cycle assessment, 
the life cycle assessment is trying to quantitatively um, assess what the, 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 the set of impacts that are associated with all those, those activities. And generally, we think of this as a, of, uh, involving three key stages. The first is to map out what all the activities that would be associated with a particular product or system. And, and we refer to that as the setting the goal and scope of the analysis. For each one of those activities, then, what we want to do is quantify the set of, of inflows, that's energy and resources, raw materials that are required to make that activity happen, and the set of emissions, that's sort of releases to land or air or water that are, also, that are associated with that um, activity. And so that, the, the combination of those inflows and outflows is something we refer to as a life cycle inventory. Or, um, um, and, and then we take that life cycle inventory and through various methods, generally things that we aren't developing here at the hub, we can use them to understand what are some of the environmental consequences of those. So what would be, we expect the global warming potential or the impact on um, smog or ozone generating um, substances. That, that's so-called um, impact assessment. One thing that I did jump over, and I apologize, I'm going to back up just because it'll play into a future um, uh, slide, is that the, the list of all the activities, so all the materials, all the transportation, all the construction activities that are associated with, um, of, with a pavement or any system, we're going to call, we have a generic name called a bill of activity. So that'll, that'll appear again in a, in a later slide. But just to give you a little bit of context, we come up with that bill of activities, we come up with the inventory associated with it, and then we map it to the impacts associated with the inventory. Now, um, a couple of other, just a little bit of uh, background before we jump into what the um, hub has been focusing on here. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a broader landscape, uh, we often get kind of a question of, you know, is there still a need for life cycle research around pavements because there has been a lot of progress in the development of so-called environmental product declarations, or EPDs. And um, just, to clear, just to sort of knock this out of the way, that, that um, the development of these EPDs is a really important step for effective, consistent life cycle assessment. But they don't solve all the problems that, that need to be addressed. So one way to think about it is that um, environmental product de declarations provide us with the life cycle inventory for pavement materials or possibly for other pavement activities, but we still need to have a consistent way to fold them all together to have the life cycle assessment for the pavement as a whole, and, and, and so that there's still a lot of um, research that needs to go on in settling what the process is for that. Now, obviously, the hub is not the only one um, that, that's addressing this kind of question. We're an active participant in the Federal Highway Administration's Sustainable Pavements Technical Working Group, um, and that group has put out a set of uh, a, a guideline framework here. This is not a so-called product category rule, which are sort of the um, prescriptive set of rules that one has to follow to, to come up with an environmental product declaration or possibly an LCA, but um, there are a set of guidelines and, and we are, the, the research you'll see all falls within the, uh, these guidelines, but still, there's still a lot of open questions even within those as to how uh, this kind of assessment needs to go on and that's, that's where the research in the hub uh, is trying to fill those gaps. So more specifically, just to give you a sense of like how we um, frame the work in the hub, like how do we, you know, what's the real gap that we're trying to address, is that what we've seen out there around things like life cycle assessment or even life cycle costing is that a typical process today is that a, a designer may have some proposed sets of designs that they are interested in for a particular context, and then they will evaluate those um, against either some fixed rules or, or possibly using more advanced tools like a um, mechanistic design or software associated with that. And they might use that, those tools to iterate on that design until they reach some performance targets. Then they have some, say, final design here. And it's not until that final design is generated that um, the bill of activities and then the life cycle assessment or life cycle costing is carried out. So, you know, that, <clears throat> 
it's probably not too hard to figure out what, what we would view as a bit of the challenge with that, and that is that if the, this kind of performance information isn't generated until the end, then it's obviously not um, actively influencing the design decisions that are being made. So the, the goal of the hub's research is to kind of close this loop and make sure that that kind of information is readily available in, in order to influence design decisions. Um, so that, that has led to um, a set of two overarching goals for our research, and that is to um, realize that kind of connection in um, an, an easy-to-use tool set that will help drive the pervasive use of both lifecycle costing and lifecycle assessment for any of the key decisions that are associated with pavements and pavement networks, so that's pavement design, uh, type selection, maintenance decisions, and then even overall asset management. And then to, um, through the development of more risk-based tools, allow those kind of decisions to be more robust in the long run. Um, we have, in order to, to realize that we've, we've already come a long way to realizing those goals, we have developed a, um, a set of tools that allow us to take the outputs of things like pavement ME and map them to the bill of activities that are relevant either for LCA or LCCA, so the material quantities, construction activities, maintenance timings, et cetera. And then we can, uh, another tool that takes that bill of activities and translates that into either cash flows for life cycle costing or um, emissions and then ultimately impacts for environmental assessment. So, so we feel like we have a, a good toolkit there. One, um, uh, not only is it um, well set up to integrate with the outputs of pavement ME, but also it um, has embedded within it the ability to generate um, probabilistic predictions of, of that, either inventory, uh, either environmental impact or cost. And just to spend just a moment on why this is really relevant, I mean, there, there's no, you know, no other aspect of the design of a pavement that we don't consider the fact that we can't know its performance with certainty. Um, we, we consider that uncertainty in the design of the thicknesses around performance. We um, consider that uncertainty in every other aspect of the design, so it only stands to reason that we should also bring that same kind of rigor to understanding cost and environmental performance, and that's what the, um, the HUDS toolkit has, is enabling today. So, um, what all is um, considered within the, the hub's current model? Um, we have certainly attempted to make it as comprehensive as possible, at least with all the decisions that are associated with the pavement design. Um, and so that includes, as I mentioned before, the um, inventory and impact associated with materials, including both their extraction or production and their transportation, um, construction activities, the uh, activities that a uh, or impacts that occur during use, so that includes obviously maintenance activities, including the materials that are needed for maintenance and their sort of uh, construction-related um, activities, but also some of the implications from the use of the road directly, so I'll, uh, show, I'll try and detail these a little bit more on the next slide, so I'll come back to that list. But, um, and then finally, um, the, the set of actions and processes that are either associated with the recycling or other kind of disposition of the uh, materials coming from the road at end of life. So let me just loop back to that um, use phase uh, bubble there because this is probably the area where the hub has been most actively innovating. It's an area that, um, you know, five or 10 years ago, there was very little um, sense of how to quantify the use phase implications of a pavement, and both uh, folks here and at other places have really been moving forward that science quite a bit. As the list there implies, uh, the set of use phase that, uh, impacts that we are currently modeling within the hub include the implications of different surface characteristics. Uh, it's referred to as albedo. You can think of it as sort of the, the reflectiveness of the, the road's uh, surface, so how much energy is um, absorbed by the road as opposed to reflected back into the atmosphere. Um, the implications of lighting, uh, because again, those same surface characteristics 
have implications for um, the appropriate level of lighting for a particular road. And then one that's uh, uh, relevant for um, concrete pavements in particular is referred to as carbonation, and that is the reabsorption of CO2 over the lifetime within, um, within concrete that occurs, you know, basically once it, once it has been produced and throughout its life. So um, the, and then there's one more that I'll, an important one that will come to the next slide. One thing just as a little plug is that um, in a future webinar, we're going to be detailing the work that we've been doing around albedo. Um, back in June, um, you learned about the sort of fourth aspect of the use phase of pavements, and that is what we refer to as pavement vehicle interaction. And uh, what we're trying to capture in this part of uh, our life cycle models is how the characteristics of the pavement impact the fuel use of the vehicles that drive on that pavement. And there are two uh, key mechanisms that we currently model here, and that is um, the one on the, um, on the left of the slide, and that is the deflection of the pavement as a vehicle, particularly a heavy vehicle, drives over, and then that deflection creates resistance to the vehicle. And then pavement roughness, uh, which um, is something that all of us experience in day-to-day -day life as we drive over pavements. And obviously, the more rough a pavement is, we expend a lot more energy of a wheel going up and down rather than uh, left to right, as it is in the, in the image here, which is obviously a waste of fuel. So um, we have built all of these uh, capabilities into the tool, the ability to integrate with Pavement ME, the ability to capture all of these different use phase um, um, implications, including the more conventional considerations of materials production and, and construction. And so we wanted to know, so what, what matters? How does this um, impact the results when we try and ask the question of what is the environmental performance of a, of a, of a pavement? And so, you know, anticipating that, that, and that there wouldn't be just a single answer, what we have done is um, worked with an outside firm, ARA, Applied Research Associates, to develop a set of, of uh, actual pavement designs for four different contexts in the U.S. Um, that allow us um, to, to actually look in detail of how a model like that translates or sort of predicts what the, the performance, environmental performance of a pavement would be. Um, for each of these design, each of these locations, we've, we have the ability to look at three different traffic levels, so from local uh, roads up to urban interstate. And we can vary a lot of different um, characteristics, including things like the maintenance schedules. Um, we, we did try to have these designed to a constant design life. and but we can look at different analysis periods. And the latter two things I won't focus on so much today, but we'll take a brief look at the impact of different maintenance schedules on our results. So we took the tool, we applied it to this set of, uh, these set of cases, and <clears throat> over the course of doing that, uh, over the last couple of years, we've learned what we think are at least five pretty important lessons. And I'm gonna share with you a set of results that try to um, just really quickly capture how it is that we, we've sort of come to these conclusions. Um, the first one is that um, it does seem that the life cycle perspective is quite relevant, that looking at an individual stage can often point you in the wrong direction, that the pavement vehicle interaction aspect of the use phase can uh, be very influential in sort of um, defining what the environmentally preferred solution is, that the what matters differs a lot depending on where we are, um, both in terms of what the road usage is, so local versus interstate, and where we are in the, in the country. Um, we've been able to demonstrate that we can, with a reasonable amount of information, generate uncertainty around these, which would, should be able to drive more robust decisions in the long run, and that we can use these tools to fairly readily identify some opportunities to improve the performance of these pavements. So uh, coming to the first point that life cycle matters, uh, you know, the, this, this set of graphs here is basically just hopefully makes this point fairly quickly. So this is uh, the results associated with the Missouri interstate. And the thing I would just draw your attention to is that, you know, conventionally people might have associated just the burdens of materials and construction with a pavement. That's this sort of um, 
uh, maroon or rust color, depending on your, your, your monitor, in the upper right quadrant of the pie chart. And uh, sort of light tan, uh, uh, hard to even call it a wedge, because it's practically the, the Pac-Man of the, the whole pie chart there. You can see uh, in both, both for um, a flexible pavement and a rigid pavement, actually is more than double um, the, 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 the impacts associated with materials and construction. I guess I should point out this is for um, a single indicator here of global warming potential, but the, the use phase can have more than double the global warming potential impacts of materials and construction. So that right away uh, points to the, how important it is to be considering the full life cycle of one of these pavements. Um, it's also important to note that within that use phase, the pavement vehicle interaction, the base the deflection and roughness effects are very important, basically the dominant drivers of that um, impact um, as at least as we're modeling it currently. So these are the these are sort of um, unpacking the use phase uh, wedge from the previous plot. And you can see that um, the, the pavement vehicle interaction in this case is more than 90% of that use phase burden. Um, in both of these cases, the, the roughness was the dominant mechanism, but that is not always the case. Um, that it can vary quite a bit from context to context as to the importance of deflection versus roughness. But in the end, it is important to be considering the pavement vehicle interaction for, for a pavement. Another way, um, um, so that not surprisingly leads us to sort of our the next point, which is that um, the context, basically the location of the pavement, um, or context matters in many different uh, in many different ways. The first one, probably the least surprising uh, one, is that depending on the context of the road in terms of its use profile, can dramatically change the environmental impact of that. So as we go from a rural highway to a um, rural local road to an urban interstate, we can see uh, almost a tenfold change in the impact per, per lane per mile of um, pavement. Uh, not too surprising there. The, um, but also what's pr what may be more surprising is that we can see even up to a 50% variation when we look at the same type of road, so these are all urban interstate results, all in terms of global warming potential for a mile of, of pavement, but across the four different locations that we investigated. You can see from the Colorado one to say the Florida, Arizona one, a swing from about 15 um, kilotons per, per mile, kiloton equivalents per mile to 22-ish for, for those the, the higher ones. So quite a bit of variation um, just based on, on location. Uh, another aspect of uh, context that, that matters, this is a real recent result, is that the maintenance and rehabilitation schedule that a particular location chooses can have a significant impact on the, on the, uh, the result. So again, same metric here, we're looking at the rural local road for Missouri. And, and the difference between the, the left here is what we are calling a conventional maintenance and rehabilitation approach as opposed to an intensive diamond grinding approach for that context. And so you can see that um, the um, amount of burden associated with the uh, maintenance and then the disposition of the output of the grinding, this so-called end-of-life burden, goes up quite a bit, but it's more than offset by an improvement of the use phase from the pavement vehicle interaction because we're keeping a smoother road. So again, uh, the specifics of the case can influence the result quite a bit. And finally, all that comes together <coughs> to, uh, to show that the uh, context matters overall because it, uh, when we take the location and we overlay with it the, the pavement material choice, we can see quite a variation in terms of the pattern of results where we have um, some cases where we have fairly um, uh, similar performance, such as in Missouri or a little somewhat similar in Colorado to very distinct re results, different, very distinct performance in contexts like Arizona and Florida. And probably what's immediately obvious to you is that well, the thing that's varying the most is that tan use phase uh, 
bar in the middle there. And so if we sort of just unpack that, those again, you can see a lot of variation um, in terms of the uh, expected amount of, of excess fuel consumption that's associated with either roughness, the darker uh, bar, or deflection, the sort of mid-colored bar in the, in the middle of each of these. So all of this uh, kind of goes to show the, the importance of having an easy-to-use tool because we can't just give a single answer for uh, that applies to every context across the country, but we feel like that, that toolkit is, is in place and ready to support these kind of decisions. So life cycle matters, context matters, um, the pavement vehicle interaction, the thing we're looking at right here on this slide matters quite a bit. Um, the, the other point that uh, we have been working hard to develop is to, to make sure that people are making use of probabilistic types of models and so that they can base their decisions not just on a single point estimate, I know that's what I've been showing in the slides up until now, um, but rather that they can, using that in, uncertainty information can have uh, risk-based decisions as well. And so the basic point here is that we, we know that we can't know the environmental impact of product A or product B with perfect certainty. And as a consequence, when we just have a point estimate, we don't, we don't, we can't draw meaningful conclusions from this information by itself. We need to know that amount of uncertainty so that we can answer the question, is A really different than B? And so with the capability that the tool has, tool set has today, we, we are able to answer that kind of question. Is there a statistically significant difference between the two? We can sort of invert the analysis, and I'll show you an example of this, which allows us to find what the key drivers of that difference are, and therefore, what are the things that um, we either need to make sure that we know well, or there are also kind of levers that can change the impact of, of that product by, by that. Just to kind of give you an example um, of, of this kind of analysis, so this is uh, a different view on the Arizona highway result that we showed, that I showed just uh, on the previous slides. So now instead of representing it as simply two bars, what we're showing you is sort of the range of, of results that one might expect for the um, two different material alternatives. <clears throat> and then, so that, uh, the first set of, bar, uh, first uh, set of ranges there is for the total result, m much like I was showing you on some of the bar graphs earlier. And then the next four unpack that into the, uh, each of the key life cycle stages that, that I uh, um, mentioned earlier in the presentation. So you can see that there is a significant amount of uncertainty um, in many of the stages, in particular the uh, use phase and to a lesser degree materials and construction, and that maps to a fair amount of uncertainty that's associated with the total result. So uh, what we have developed um, is an approach to be able to answer questions for cases like these where there is a lot of uncertainty to ask, is design A um, actually, you know, statistically defensively different than design B. So now in this particular case, there's quite a bit of separation um, between the two, and so you probably don't need a, a sophisticated statistical test for this, but just to kind of give you a more, a, a, a more example case, um, it's not unusual for us to end up with a, a set of results like the one that I'm presenting here, where the two ranges would have significant overlap um, you know, so design C being the, the gray line, design A being the dark line, and we want to answer the question, can we um, defensively say that design C has a lower impact than design A? And so uh, I won't um, go into the details of this, but what we do is we very carefully set up these two simulations of A and C, and we track for each of those simulation instances um, how often it is that design um, C ends up with a lower impact than design A. And so that gives us actually a distribution of those kind of ratios. So that's the uh, distribution of the ratio of the impact of C to the impact of A. And what we want to look at is basically the, the, the amount of area that sits on this side of some threshold. So in this case, if we set that threshold to one, we want to know how frequently does uh, C have a lower impact than A. 
and then the magnitude of that allows us to comment on the statistical significance of the difference. Now, for the case that I just showed you, this Arizona case, these plots actually look more like this, so where, where we have a very distinct difference between the two designs in almost every simulation that we run would um, indicate that design C is, has a lower impact than, than design A, and so we would feel comfortable for this particular case declaring that the difference is statistically significant. Um, we can also take this kind of information and identify um, what are some of the key drivers of the difference between a design, and so we've done that for um, each of the, the design and context variants that, that I presented to you earlier. And so what, what, what this table is indicating here is for each of the scenarios in the rows, um, with, what kind of uncertain information was sort of a key driver in the resulting difference in the design? And so pro it, all, you can see that universally the key driver of uncertainty is the impact that's associated with cement production. In most cases, the, the second most influential one is uncertainty about future traffic growth, and then the third one is uh, sort of goes between the impact, uncertainty and impact for bitumen and uncertainty in, in future roughness deterioration. So the way that one makes use of this information is if we had a, um, a uh, analysis that came out and said that uh, the, the two designs were, rel were too close to call, we weren't sure whether design A was had a different performance than design B, um, then what we want to do is turn to these three, four pieces of information to see if we can get better estimates of them. So for the impact factor for cement or the impact factor for bitumen, the obvious way that we would pursue that is to try to maybe make use of uh, EPDs for the facility that might be producing that and get, therefore we, have, we could refine our estimate of those impacts and hopefully come back and actually be able to return a result that would allow a decision maker to know that um, a is different than B. Um, so uh, all of this kind of has allowed us to have a tool set that is going out there that, that can be used in, in cases to facilitate decisions that, um, that look at the true trade-offs that are out there. So trade-offs in sort of uh, traffic performance, urban heat island performance, um, trade-offs in the cost of that pavement design, and also trade-offs in terms of their environmental impacts. Everything I showed you today was around global warming potential, but the, the tools that we have developed actually allow us to generate um, estimates for um, other impact indicators as well, such as smog or uh, other forms of ecotoxicity. So, so using that kind of information, um, we have identified some um, things that can be done within pavements. This is an area that we're sort of actively trying to update. You saw the earlier results about diamond grinding. Well, you know, what are some of the opportunities out there to um, improve the performance of a particular pavement design, not even in a comparative setting, but for any given context? And so um, there's a white paper out on the Hub's website that gives more details on this, but you can, this plot tries to summarize what some of the things that we have identified, such as um, improving uh, the design of pavements and so not over-designing them. That's this uh, blue box on the left-hand side here. I guess I should give you a sense of what this uh, uh, plot is trying to show, and that is in the vertical axis, what we're trying to show is the cost-effectiveness of employing a particular design, So, uh, and then in the um, x-axis is trying to show what uh, the implications would be in terms of global warming potential reduction for implementing that change. And so um, improving design obviously saves both in terms of materials and then translates into saved uh, global warming potential. So it has both cost savings and global warming potential savings. Things like increasing fly ash can also have both cost savings and global warming potential savings. Then you have other things such as the diamond grinding example, which would uh, be underneath this, uh, the sort of zebra-striped little panel there toward the middle, the extra rehabilitation, which obviously incurs some extra cost, but has some benefit in terms of the environmental performance. So 
the tools are uh, capable of analyzing these for any given context, and we're sort of actively trying to develop a set of case studies to get some more generalized lessons of uh, like like this initial analysis. So in the end, uh, hopefully, these results give you a sense that the uh, hub's research has been um, important both in developing a tool, but that tool has allowed us to really identify that for pavement decision making, taking a life cycle perspective is critical. We can't just look at one phase like the impacts associated with materials um, without um, potentially making some uh, harmful decisions. Um, within one of those phases, the, the use phase, the the, pave, the way, the characteristics of the pavement and how they impact the vehicles that drive on them can be a key driver of the environmental performance associated with that pavement. Um, there's not a universal answer for every context that the, uh, what matters most varies a lot depending on the context, both in the type of road and where that road is. Um, it is possible with a reasonable amount of information that, that's available to decision makers today to not only get a point estimate, but to get the, un, the uh, full perspective of the uncertainty associated with those, which allows for more robust decisions and in particular risk-based decisions. And using these kinds of tools, we um, can fairly readily identify key strategies for reducing the, the environmental performance of any given payment. Um, some things that we've generally learned from that, that latter category is that in the materials and construction area, uh, as I mentioned before, the increased use of supplementary cementitious materials is, is, is a key strategy for driving down the impacts of, of pavements making use of concrete. Um, on the asphalt side, reducing construction-related um, impacts and re reducing transportation distances for materials. On the use phase, um, reducing the excess fuel consumption that's associated with deflection is, is, a, is a key by increasing pavement stiffness. And managing pavement roughness is another key strategy for reducing the, the in, uh, use phase impacts associated with excess fuel consumption. Um, and sort of where the, re the hub's research is currently uh, aiming at, I've kind of alluded to this, is carrying out a set of case studies that are combining both um, environmental performance assessment with cost assessment so we can truly identify where the eco-efficient solutions are. What, you know, is it, is it more eco-efficient to focus on the use of recycled materials or instead to drive uh, changes in the way um, materials and rehabilitation are happening or possibly to be doing a better job in the way we're allocating those rehabilitation activities across the network as a whole. So you can look for that kind of uh, research coming coming out of the hub in the um, upcoming months and, and years. And I just would uh, conclude by just letting folks know that the uh, slide deck will go out with sort of details of where you can find um, some some references that back up each of the analyses that I presented today. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ann and just say um, thank you for everyone for attending and look forward to some interesting questions uh, coming, coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, if there are any questions, like I said at the beginning, please feel free to um, answer them, or I'm sorry, ask them via the Q&A uh, function at the top of your screen, or if you prefer, use the chat function. Uh, and, and we will address them. And I just wanted to note, uh, uh, Dr. Christine uh, referenced uh, some past webinars that we've done. If you weren't present for those webinars, you can find those on our YouTube channel. Um, our, our username is just CSHubMIT, all one word. Um, so if you go to YouTube and search CSHubMIT, you can find, uh, find those past webinars. And we do have one question. Uh, how did you assess the fuel consumption due to pavement deflection and roughness? Yeah, that's a, a, a great question. Um, so the, the hub has developed a, a mechanistic model um, that has been uh, calibrated against a number of different um, real-world world data sources, and those, that is the model um, that, that was used in the analyses presented here. Um, I, that, the, there's a lot more details on that on that June webinar, and um, you know, if anyone, if if you wanted to email either myself or Ann, I'd be happy to follow up with a lot more specifics on that. Um, but 
you know, at a high level, that that's the, the the tool that was used here. And I'll also add on our website, uh, we've recently added some subpages um, topically. So we do have uh, a pavements, um, a pavement vehicle interaction page on our website that kind of houses all of our. Uh, research briefs and, and other information on the topic. Um, so do feel free to check that out as well. But yes, as Randy said, please um, feel free to send uh, questions or um, uh, along to either one of us. All right, our next question is, can you please mention the LCA approach you are using for modeling, uh, in parentheses, process-based or EIO? Question. Mm, okay, that's, that's great, yeah. Um, this, this is all a, a process-based model, uh, just for uh, Folks that might not be familiar, um, there are, as the question kind of alludes to, um, there are many different ways to kind of break down the field of life cycle assessment. And one of the key breakdowns is whether or not uh, there is an a attempt to uh, describe the set of processes and then directly describe the set of inflows and outflows that are associated with those processes. Um, that has a challenge associated with it which is really just a kind of a, a practical challenge, which is that ultimately, um, you know, any process depends on many, many inputs to that process, and then those processes depend on many, many other inputs and so forth and so on. And so generally from a practical perspective, there's always some truncation of the, of the system that, that's being analyzed. And so that's obviously an, uh, a deviation from that initial metaphor uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, which is to try and be as holistic as possible. So an alternative approach that has been proposed is that th this, uh, this doesn't just occur with environmental impacts, but also with um, economic flows in the economy. And for a number of years, economists have made use of what are called economic input-output data to try to account for all the derivative flows that are associated with a particular activity. And so uh, that has sort of structurally would address this issue of, uh, of truncation error. The challenge for it and the reason that we haven't applied it in this particular context is that the, the level of granularity for that economic input output data is, is necessarily much less granular um, than we feel is needed to look at the kind of details of questions that we're looking at here. But um, there is a lot of research going on on how to marry the two. Um, we haven't really gotten to doing that within the hub yet. So this is all uh, process-based. Okay, this is related. It's actually a follow-up from the same masker. Uh, since you are modeling for policymaking, why do you not use consequential LCA instead of attributional? Mm -hmm. um, so that probably also warrants a little bit of uh, background. So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different ways to sort of slice the, the field. Uh, another way to slice the field, particularly within the process space, is whether or not um, we're trying to look at um, the, the case as it is today, so which is often referred to as attributional, um, sort of uh, uh, what the set of activities would be today, as opposed to um, consequential, which is how would this change lead to a marginal change in the system? Um, the area within LCA where this has gotten the most um, examination is around things like biofuels. So if you ever see a study that is looking at something like biofuels production, then um, at least current state of the art for most of those would typically be so-called consequential LCAs. So with that uh, background, for those that weren't as familiar, uh, the answer to the question is, is that the, the motivation of this work has had, the genesis of this work was to inform individual pavement selection decisions. So for this particular road um, and this segment of this road in Missouri or in Arizona or in wherever. And so the magnitude of that change in our mind was one that was un, not particularly consistent with a consequential perspective. So just, just again, for folks that are less familiar, um, at a high level, the, re the reason we would look at, the, the field would look at biofuels with a consequential model is because this idea is that the la large scale introduction of something like biofuels would actually change the way that crop production occurs. 
And so, therefore, it wouldn't be appropriate to just look at today's activities. We would look, need to understand how that um, changed the world, so to speak. And so uh, our sense was that these individual payment selection decisions wouldn't meet that threshold of change, and so that we have mostly relied on an attributional perspective. Um, you know, I suspect, I guess, you know, if we were to look at large-scale changes uh, across even a state, then that might need to be revised. But that, that's sort of the, the reasoning, and that's where we are today. Thank you. This is a related question in terms of, I guess, expressing the results uh, in different metrics. And this is, can you put the global warming results in terms uh, such as if you build 10 miles of concrete roads instead of asphalt, is that like taking a certain number of cars off the road or, or things like that? So is there another way to express um, what you've been discussing uh, in that kind of metric? Yeah, so that um, that's a great question. and I. I <laughs> I wish we had done that. Um, in other, so the um, DOE and in particular the Energy Information Agency has some nice um, online tools that do that very kind of thing, which is sort of take um, global warming changes and, and relate them to things that like what what you alluded to. That um, unfortunately we haven't done that, which. As soon as the question is asked, I ask myself why we haven't done that. I'm not sure, but uh, we we certainly will for for future ones. It, it can be done. It should be done, and and we should have done it before now. But but I, I don't want to just do it off the top of my head because I, I I would want to make sure it was carefully done. But let's make sure by the time we next one of these that that we do that. So thank you for that input. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is um, regarding the tools you've discussed and, and who can access those tools in order to create a project-specific LCA? Yeah, um, we would, uh, so, so currently they're not just posted up on the, on the web. Um, I think that we've done a good job of making a tool. Um, I don't think we're great at designing a user interface, so we would um, like to just walk somebody through that. but. I, any so we've worked with a number of states at this point. Anybody that would be interested in doing it, um, we would be open to to sharing that tool with. So I think the best strategy there would be to email myself or or Ian, and and we could set somebody up with that. Great. I'm uh, seeing just one more question here, but we do have some more time. If you have other questions, please uh, please do get them in. Uh, and the question is, do you have a database with the usual impacts and CO2 impacts? Um, so, I might ask somebody to follow up on that after I answer it because I'm not 100% sure of what they're, what the, so, so the, I would interpret that of one of two ways. So on the, um, on, for cement, we, ha we have worked with the industry and collected up primary data and um, have, um, Sort of develop that into an LCI that we make use of in the in the tool. Um, for other activities, we are relying on secondary databases, um, so things like EcoInvent, Gabby, um, okay, and the US LCI uh, data sets to to fill in the the inventories that are associated with the other materials or other activities in here. So so the only um, uh, data set that we have that's not publicly available, although we are really close to having it um, being published, is the cement uh, LCI data that I made reference to. So I'm, I'm not sure if that answered the question, sorry. I'm going to assume it does, no follow-up question on it, uh, but okay. we certainly can as I, you know, the asker or anyone else who wants, would like some more information on the topic, um, do email us at cshub at mit.edu. Uh, I can be reached directly at Ann, Ann and E at MIT.edu. Let me just do a quick check to see if there are any other questions. Oh, we do have one more. Have you done this analysis with the other impact categories? If so, how do the results differ? Hmm. Um, we have, and um, sort of that that is actively under review right now. Um, there's not a simple answer to, to how it differs uh, because the uh, impact of different materials in different contexts um, 
varies a lot across the different impact categories. So, I think the best. Uh, yeah, I wish we. I wish that had already gone through review and we could share that more conclusively with you. But I think that um, having a, a better summary of that is probably just going to have to wait until we we have that more um, peer reviewed. Thank you. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, and I'm not seeing any, so we'll say thank you all for attending today's presentation. Our next public webinar is scheduled for December. We'll take a short break for the next few months, but uh, scheduled for December. Uh, and the, the current uh, scheduled topic is competition in paving. Um, so we hope you can join us for that. And uh, we will have this presentation up on our YouTube channel soon. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.